All right. Everybody have a notebook? Yes. Yes. Turn behind tab one. I am going to quickly um, overview our agenda. And uh, then Kenneth and Scott for a few minutes just sort of talk about the goals for today. Uh, we are going to have an open session starting now, talking about the, the agenda goals. Then we're going to do a session that will run to about 11 30, sorry, 11. Um, on uh, strategic sources to how we leverage our purchasing power and some of the early work there. Uh, I assume this time is right here, Scott. That is correct. So yes. the, the, it's 11 then. We have Dennis McDonough joining us or 11.30. Dennis is actually joining us at 11.30. Okay. This is, um, again, the time uh, time's shifted a little bit. It's 11.30 that Dennis is joining us. Okay, so 11.30 to 12. That is correct. Will be Dennis McDonough, who is the Deputy National Security Advisor. No specific agenda. But we, in the past, have had folks come in and talk about domestic policy, the economy. I thought it would be interesting to have someone on the foreign policy. You, side. Want, to be, you want to be scared, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> scared. 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 Um, <laughs> then we will have, uh, we'll probably do a working lunch as we pivot to 12.15 to 1.30. We're going to spend that time on two topics. One is improper payments. We've got some good early work going on there, too. And then while we have Taking on two new topics, strategic sourcing and improper payments, I think we all agree we want to continue to drive implementation on the 2011 initiatives, IT and the SES. So we do updates on the two of those to ensure that we are continuing to make progress there. Uh, quickly talk about next steps, and then we're going to walk over to the Roosevelt Room for some time with the President. With that, let me hand it to Scott for a couple minutes. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Jeff. My name is Scott Winslow. I'm the Executive Director for the President's Management Advisory Board and the um, designated federal officer as well. Um, very quickly, uh, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to spend our time today talking about both improper payments and strategic sourcing. And thank you very much to uh, all the PMAP members, both for their time uh, as well as their patience across the last couple of days as the calendar has shifted uh, a little bit. Um, we heard a couple of days ago that the President was actually going to have some time this afternoon to meet with the PMAB uh, members. And as such, uh, his calendar is a little less forgiving than the rest of ours. So we've had to move things about a little bit. So thank you both for your patience and your understanding. <clears throat> Across our time uh, today, we really hope to have uh, a discussion with um, all of you here. And part of the reason for this board actually being in existence is to take advantage of the expertise and the experience that you all can bring to bear on the management issues and challenges that are faced inside the federal government. So um, we would like for this to be a conversation, not a presentation. So please feel free to stop us as we move along. I know most of you are not shy. We've had the opportunity to spend some time with uh, all of you. And uh, we do thank you both for your individual uh, contributions and conversations as well as the um, uh, experts inside of your companies that you've given us access to. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we're going to run up until about 1.30, at which point we will move on uh, over to the West Wing to meet with President Obama. I just wanted to remind folks that this is, in fact, a, a, an open meeting. Uh, it is being uh, webcast at the moment. We will close uh, the session at uh, one point across the day uh, and then reopen it uh, after, after lunch. With that, uh, let me turn the, uh, the podium back over to uh, Jeff and to uh, Joe Jordan. Okay, so strategic sourcing. Yes, thank Joe. you. Thanks, Jeff. So as we go through the strategic sourcing uh, session this morning, I said a few things. First, I wanted to quickly recap the scope uh, of the issue and also the problem we are trying to solve. I wanted to outline some of the really helpful input we've already gotten from our subcommittee members around the table so that uh, the, the rest of the PMAB members and, and the deputy secretaries joining us could hear. And then we really wanted to spend the bulk of the time getting uh, some additional thoughts from you on how we could take the private sector best practices and make them real as we drive hard against this over the next couple of months. Um, within the government. And to that end, I'm going to ask some prompting questions, framing certain issues that you guys have raised and things that you've said are critical to any strategic sourcing effort to help refine those and how we can uh, go forward and execute. And then uh, my colleague, Acting Administrator Tangeri from GSA, whose team has uh, been partnered with us on the calls and the site visits and all of those types of things, will also outline some of uh, GSA-specific strategic sourcing challenges and opportunities against them. 
So with that, uh, if you go to slide one, which has the, the charts, on the left-hand side, again, you, you saw this, we've just refined the numbers a little bit, but there, there's a tremendous opportunity when we talk about buying smarter within federal government contracting. We spend about $535 billion each year, and even when we you know, take a real look at that pie and pull out things like major weapon systems and, and other things that probably aren't addressable by strategic sourcing, you're still left with a pot of approximately $150 billion in annual prime contracts that we think uh, we could improve upon how we uh, procure those goods and services. What's the major issue that we're running up against that we're trying to solve with strategic sourcing? On the right-hand side, it shows the, the decentralized and fragmented spend. We have myriad agencies engaging with the same vendors. Um, and because of differences in sophistications, quantities that they're purchasing, et cetera, it results in, in widely varying prices for the same item. So fully loaded phone and data plan in the exact same metropolitan area, you see uh, approximately 3x variance between three agencies. Now, one other thing that we've really learned and that we want to highlight is that this is happening within the same agencies as well. You know, for far too long, we have purchased not as the largest buyer of goods and services in the world and fully leveraging that buying power, but rather as 130 mid-sized companies dealing with uh, various vendors. And so we've got to fix that. So how, you know, what, what have you guys told us and what have we learned um, in, in terms of a path forward? The next slide, uh, slide five, outlines a few of these things. So what did we hear from the PMAP subcommittee members that we spoke to? And thank you again. We had calls with everyone. Um, many of you sent in some documentation, put us on with your uh, tactical leaders. We've done some site visits and we plan to do more, so it was incredibly helpful. We learned a few lessons, um, and, and we're gonna have some of the PMAP members yourself go through a, a few of them in a moment, but I wanted to outline the things on the left-hand side here. That senior leadership, top-level commitment is key to the success of these efforts. You need to have cross-functional coordination um, if you're gonna have these things deployed. It can't just be your procurement folks saying, we need to go do this. You gotta get the program people, the people in the factory floors who say, but I can find the Loctite cheaper if I just do it on my own. I don't wanna engage in your overall contract. Getting them bought in from the beginnings. And I know, Tim, I think you're gonna talk about some of this with the Cummins wave teams and, and those sorts of things. The need to collect and analyze transaction level data. Getting down deep into the data you use. Gail, I know you talked about the journey that Red Cross has gone through, and we're going to have a chance to have you outline some of that. But you, I heard over and over on the phone, data is key, data is key, we've got to drive it through the data. Then setting the aggressive goals. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stakes, you know, flags we're going to put pretty far out there. Jeff's been very clear about his desire to do something aggressive here. But we want to make sure that sort of thing resonates with all of you. And then lastly, this is not a fire and forget exercise. It's a continuous improvement. Many of you have talked about, you know, this has been 10 years in the making. I heard things like, when we started this in 95, dot, 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 you know, and we understand that, but given the size of our spend, we know we can capture some quick wins. A few things, so I want to, I didn't want to make this a PowerPoint heavy conversation, so I want to engage on this slide for a minute. As we look at the right hand side, this is where I want to start to really uh, make this a, a dialogue and stop talking. It, under the senior leadership, the two things that we're thinking as we take what you have done and apply it to us is making sure that we've got an accountable official at each agency, a strategic sourcing advocate is what the term of art that I've thought of based on what a lot of you have said, uh, and, and also making sure that you use that top level commitment to issue some agency wide or company wide guidance use policy, say, hey, you have to do this. You know, three of our five calls had a comment, well, why can't you just make them do this? <laughs> and the more we thought about it, let's not talk about the problems, let's talk about the solutions. In a lot of ways, we can. So let's, you know, as long as we've got our agency partners bought in and everybody's on the same page, let's issue some guidance that says, you have to do this. Were those, did we capture the right <laughs> elements there? Is that right, you know, you all talked about the top level commitment and those of you who weren't on our team but certainly know this issue quite well. Have we? What do you think is the uh, right way to address that high level accountability? How did you do it? That I'm going to use different language than okay. advocate. Okay. Okay. I think we need to be direct, right? This is a, this is a, this is real dollars that could be put to better use. Advocate means that we think it's a good idea and we'd like to advocate. If you start with that tonality, you're going to continue to get an opt in and opt out. That's just yeah. yeah. I think, uh, at least in, in Cummins' cases, that um, we were in the 90s in crisis mode and 
if you looked at our balance sheet, material and indirect materials was the biggest item. So we couldn't get to our profitability without dealing with that in a, a systemic way. And the second is that the, the current chairman and CEO, we put him in that area at the time. What was so, his position at the time? Um, well, he, he had, uh, had been in strategy work, but he was a uh, um, high potential, so we had made him head of purchasing. Head of purchasing. Um, actually, uh, yeah, I think we call it purchasing, then it's now supply chain management. And reported to you? No, he reported to the president of the company. I was the chairman and CEO, but then this is when we engaged McKinsey and did the wave thing. So what, what happened is that you've got people from various functions and various uh, businesses all together bundling types of buys and doing a lot of analysis on where do we buy, why do we buy it there, you know, what are we paying, what's the range of paying, what should we be paying, you know, and then what would come out of that would be a plan for that particular wave. And so that's how you got cross-functional buy-in. And now he's currently the chairman and CEO and the head of supply chain management works directly for him. So there is absolute compliance. At least we think there's absolute compliance. I'm not sure that we know uh, completely, but that's where people understand that. We talk about supply chain management with the analysts. We give the analysts the goals, so the analysts and our shareholders hold us accountable in that area. So you get a lot of that out there, then you know, you'll get the focus. And when people see that this is politically correct and important to the company, then they buy into it. Where is this looking now at this end of the table? Where does this reside right now within the agency? Is there someone in the bill that you hold accountable for this, or is it many? Well, you know, the, the, all of our departments are multifaceted. We've, you know, in our office of the secretary, we've got a chief acquisition officer, Nancy Gunnison, actually is here. Um, and we set policies, but we've got 10 operating divisions. NIH is one of them. The Indian Health Service is another. And in each of those places, we've got budget officials, we've got procurement officials, you know, contract officers, program people. So you know, one of the one of the things I'd love to hear you all talk about is when you've got disparate divisions that have different missions. You know, how does one sort of provide some consistent uh, direction? And the other big issue for us, Jeff, since I, you gave me the floor for a moment, is um, we've got competing priorities. We've made a major push across the department to, for small business procurement. And um, you know, there's a major focus on sustainability. And so when you've got sort of multiple, as a government agency, we've got multiple goals. And um, you know, communicating that clearly to employees, giving them a sense of their priorities, and then holding people accountable you know, is, um, is complex. And so as we as we try to up the ante in strategic sourcing and really get people to focus on it and use it more, and Dan, you can you know you can help us with this. Um, sort of, we're going to have to balance these competing priorities, or figure out how to make clear to employees, our procurement officials, you know how to balance. Them. I don't know if I, I know I have another part on this section. I can't help but jump in. Dan, yeah, just in just two two sentences on GSA. Well, so. GSA is the, and I'll talk a little bit about this, to some extent we're supposed to provide vehicles that agencies can use. Um, we are taking a leadership role working with Joe uh, and OMB to try to provide strategic sourcing vehicles. Um, but we are, we are an option, we're an option that, that agencies can choose to use or not. But I was going to talk about my role, my former role as the Chief Acquisition Officer, among other things, at the Treasury Department where we had this leadership role where we were trying to organize the, um, the uh, acquisition of the department, the you know, billions of dollars we spent there, about seven. Um, but as Bill said, that leadership role was not a direct hierarchical one. We didn't, you know, we, we didn't have clear reporting, line of sight reporting of those acquisition officials through that CAO. So we had 10 acquisition shops. Ten leaders of those acquisition shops who thought their priority was their particular bureau, not necessarily the agency, mm -hmm. and as you point out, not necessarily these higher goals established by the administration for small business and social economic buying. And so we have many layers of kind of lack of direct oversight of how these things uh, get acquired. 
Can I ask a structural question? Because oftentimes, you guys have talked a lot about the challenges just inherent in the government and, and bundling and getting together. And so I guess one question I have for you, and it's a, something that's worked in the past for us, is um, what are the incentives or the responsibility on the vendor to bundle together? Because that's not a core competency of yours. You're, you're never going to be able to do it to the extent that other people can. So many organizations have taken, have put the responsibility on the vendor to say, you bundle us, okay, because that, that's a core competency of you as a private enterprise. You bundle us and come back with a, a rate to us. Because I just think you need to be honest about your ability to herd cats with some of the structure that's here, put the onus on them. I'm not going to mention any companies, but there's a very successful retail company that's gotten very large by putting the um, responsibility for um, for that type of thing on their um, on their vendors. And what they're able to do is trade the scale of that organization. Say, if you bundle us, you get us. Correct. And we have a tendency to, we'll do it 10 times in the treasury department, never mind uh, turning it over to an organization to bundle the treasury department. That's the whole strategic sourcing around office supplies is our first attempt to say, show us what an entire bundle would look like for the federal government, and we'll, we'll price that against the way we're doing it now. I'll tell you a little bit about mm -hmm. our relative success in that area. Just that, yeah, and I think you just kind of push on that a little bit, because we have in the third section about the data, one of the things that we're thinking about doing, taking out of some of the comments that we had heard with our subcommittee, was mandating in contracts that the vendors at least give us certain levels of price and transaction data, because right now we just don't have that visibility. So that was our kind of interim step mm -hmm. to try to get to that. Does that do you think that's on the right path? Is sure. it? Okay. Sure. And I can assure you, they have that data. Oh, that's yeah. their yeah. They're, they're, laughing laughing. they're looking at that's your slide on the previous page with yes. the 39 and they're smiling and they're smiling yes. they're going you know keep selling more to that 120 That's guy. Right. so they have the data and they can come back and tell you how big a purchaser you are if you can't and it's reasonable for us to ask that oh, yes. okay but realize they won't want to give it to you of course so to work hard yes but that goes to the whole crux issue where we are the largest buyer. But Let's use a little of that muscle. New territory by insisting on no. that yes <laughs> <They're not laughs> at all. they know it I know it. Okay, so one question I have quickly is, to what extent do you use the planning process and integrated planning process in the organization as an action forcing event? In other words, if you think about two different departments, sure. and to the extent you have an annual planning process that, that, that is integrated, each area builds a plan that reflects the um, purchasing savings, et cetera. So it's their goal, it's their plan but there's an integrated view around how that's going to be achieved and that people are held accountable in the context of their own business plan. So could you say a word about that? Is, is, is that present? Is that a capability you have or use or think about using? I could definitely say a word and then if any of the, the experts would like to chime in, but I, I would just say that we are definitely doing certain things in that direction. I know Steve Van Roekel, the CIO, who I believe will join us later, uh, and I are going around to the different agencies through the portfolio status meetings, talking about just that, really pushing investment review boards that combine <clears throat> these various management functions into one decision-making uh, body, which is you know, a very common private sector instance. But too frequently, unlike Tim's example, where you know the chairman and CEO came from procurement you know, or worked in procurement, which is one of the biggest things we took out of that site visit, other than the deconstructed engine in the lobby. I, had to be pulled away from. <laughs> Other, is that in government, it's an ancillary function too frequently. And we need to make, we're talking about something that drives decisions around $535 billion annual spend. It needs to be brought into that court. So we're, we're making progress, but I think it still varies. Huh? John, you are not a. Yeah, it, I, 10 seems to be the number of the day here. We, we have 10 operating administrations that are fairly uh, independent in transportation. We brought them together under uh, strategic sourcing executive steering committee. And I chair it, and, and the, to Dan's point about the no clear lines of responsibility, we actually established it here and built by consensus uh, a plan, uh, the low hanging fruit we go after, we establish targets on it. And I think one of the important attributes is we said explicitly early on that the savings <coughs> accrue back to the, to the operating administration. Mm -hmm. you keep it. It. So you can uh, reinvest it in your priorities. That made buy-in actually a whole lot easier. So we're, we're through the first couple of them. Uh, we estimated what the savings would be from strategic sourcing uh, in the first uh, one we did. 
Um, what was it? Uh, it was its uh, uh, peripheral uh, uh, devices uh, and servers, and uh, we're at about 7.7 .7 million savings. Uh, we anticipate will be over eight, and that's that's right in the mid range of what we thought we'd be. So you, you can actually measure it. Right. Can I ask I was going to say sure. that's a very important point, and what I made when yes. we had our um, conversation is that you, the savings have to um, be reapplied to something that matters to yeah. the people that are finding the savings. I mean, in my business, you know, we always say we want the money to go on the screen because we're in hmm. the TV business. So if we can save money by, you know, saving money on cell phones or you know, all the other ancillary things, it really makes a difference to the company because we're putting the money where we should and what matters to our audience. So, um, you know, I don't know what the, the uh, analogy is for different. It's very analogous. Yeah. So you talked about your different shows, getting them bought in, right. you know, with the centralized efforts. The same thing with a lot of the 10 different yeah. departments. Joe, just playing timekeeper, should we have Tim? Just, just one of the, yeah, I'm happy to do that, but. Just to talk about the goals, what we found when we did the wave thing is savings be 30 to 40 percent. I mean, they're huge if you do the analysis. And Joe, you know the process because I think you were working for McKinsey at the time or something like that. Um, I you know, just a you know a couple of things that this isn't in the, the uh, book, but this is a Cummins started in the 90s, so it is it long process to have what they call a Cummins production system and one function in the production system is purchasing. So we have what we call functional excellence. So we define uh, and break down the purchasing flow of searching, uh, sourcing, uh, contract development, negotiations, uh, how to pay, supplier management, risk management, change management, supplier quality improvement. And then we have uh, what that means, what falls in that area. And ideally, and I realize that this is impossible, but if you could get all of um, the agencies into a centralized purchasing function and have one common system, um, it, it, would, it would save you literally hundreds of billions of dollars. And so, I mean, the, the stakes are that high. It does require, though, software development. Um, and so you're caught in this bind about, I've got to spend money to save money. But my argument is that the return on that software, if it's done well, is just you know enormous. Um, the, I guess you know rather than you know, Cummins was we have four businesses, uh, we probably have plants in 70 different locations in 30 different countries. So we're not the federal government, but you know it's a fairly complex organization, so yeah. it can be done. Um, when talking to the people that hosted you during the visit, yes. um, they had four observations slash recommendations, and rather than go through all the visit, I thought I'd just touch on those mm -hmm. four. Um, first, you've already identified it, that uh, I guess you have 35 different purchasing systems, um, and if you can consolidate that into 17 or whatever it is, and maybe you can't do total, but you can consolidate around certain commodities, um, and that's where the software development. So too many systems, try and reduce the number of systems you have. Uh, the second one is, a, I don't know what you do about it, but I guess there's 36,000 acquisition officers or buyers, but two-thirds of them are in the Department of Defense. Yes. So the Department of Defense is setting policies and processes that the other third inherit, they're going to not necessarily be aligned with what your objectives are. So somehow, I think you've got to get the Department of Defense um, into this process, if at all possible, and 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 work closely together. I can I handled defense sales a long, long time ago in the 80s, and. Um, Essentially, we got out of that business because we couldn't afford to do business with the government. Um, and I mean, just uh, the procurement policies, the costs associated with that, the abuses that were in there, the rotation that every three years the procurement officers moved made it very, very difficult. So there's a lot of um, opportunity here if, in fact, you can get cooperation. Um, yeah. The second one, or the third one, Again, I don't know what, what you can do about it, but 
uh, your annual budget process makes it incredibly difficult because you get the right you, guy at the table. You, so. you, you, <laughs> you, you don't have a budget, so late appropriation leads to spend it or lose it. Um, you have to do it quickly, so you may not get all the analysis and the data that you need, so you, you're subject to mistakes. So again, going back to some kind of system like this and dividing the scope of what buyers could do and what they should do, at least giving them some direction. I'm not, I know you're not going to change the, the budgeting process, but if you can figure out how to optimize that for you. And then the, the fourth observation is that, um, as, as on the GSA side, is that um, because of the recent um, lack of compliance, there's somewhat of a crisis, as I understand it. And to quote uh, Ron Emanuel, never waste a crisis. So, you know, you might be able to take some of the um, problems that you've had there in other areas and really make them visible in the sense of we really need to fix this and we need to do it in a hurry and it's the right thing for the country, but use that crisis to be able to move it. And that's, again, at Cummins, um, if we, I mean, we were really, really in trouble. And so if we hadn't mm -hmm. had three or four initiatives, this being one of them, so we made it very right. visible. It's interesting because I think you're, you're right. I hadn't thought about the GSA situation as the crisis is opportunity and we have the right leader to do that. When you initially say crisis up front, I was just thinking about the budget pressure we're under. Um, you know, a few years ago, whether it was in this area or in proper payments or elsewhere, in a growing budget environment, it was a little harder to get people's attention. Danny and I talked about this a lot. Danny works closely with the FCC in particular. It's pretty easy to get people's attention now because their budgets aren't growing. And they want to invest in mission and policy. Um, so there is a real opportunity for sort of the macro, quote, crisis of the budget. And I think there's an interesting link to GSA and new leadership. But Tim's right. right, that is when it happens almost in every yeah. organization, right? So why is GSA, I, I, a comment I wrote down, GSA is an option, I think is the yeah. word used. So, so help me, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, actually, and, and that was really, if you don't mind, that's kind of the introductory part of what I was going to talk about, who is GSA, um, and kind of, yeah. I'm the... Yeah, we're going to jump ahead. No, it's, it's yeah. perfect. Let's do that, and then we'll circle back to Yale in a few minutes later. If that's okay. Just um, go. Yeah, and tell us if you want to use any of your slides or not. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not... It's not really on there. In 1949, a, a predecessor of the PNAC called the Hoover Commission, appointed by Truman, was dealing with these same issues. The question is, how do we leverage the scale and the scope of the federal government, and how do we organize things like our real estate holdings, and how do we, you know, how do we stop buying dumb? We buy once, we buy smart, we buy well. Um, the problem is then we created a monopoly that lasted for about 40 years, and what happened is it there was a sense that the service provision we provided was declining in quality. And so in the early 90s, something under called the Clinger Cohen Act passed and essentially rendered GSA an option with an idea to try to leverage you know, some of the best practices of private sector in the form of competition. And so what we did was, in essence, push out that acquisition uh, activity into the agency so smart guys like John could you know, get the acquisition workforce focused on these goals. The problem is then, whether the competition is real or not, you know, or we, can people really switch between? Uh, they've built these uh, these organizations that are maybe focused on some priorities, but not all the common priorities. And so, this source of um, opportunity that we provide people called the GSA schedules, which is essentially a pre-cleared set of vendors with a list price that is uh, that is uh, obvious and transparent, and frankly, a jumping-off point for uh, for negotiation now has about 11% uh, of the marketplace. And you've got a terrible chicken egg problem because of it being voluntary in that he can't promise to deliver a certain amount of quality, right? Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And Deborah's going to say, well, why would I mm -hmm. opt into that? I might be better on my own. Mm -hmm. If everybody held hands and came in together, then Dan could deliver a much better. It's so it's this. But isn't it the same problem? Basically, GSA is the same problem we're trying to solve inside of the 10 groups inside of organization that are trying to be siloed, right? So you say inside an agency, you've got fragmentation. Right. At the federal government, you've got much larger fragmentation. So it's really the same problem. Yes, but, you, but you're doing it, I assume when you come in and make it work, you're doing it much more tops down. It's your pushback on advocate. In essence, Dan's whole or organization is an advocacy organization. I, I just wondered, though, whether this is relevant to, to you. My, in my experience across many different companies, but most recently even at Pfizer, there's a, there's a real difference between 
uh, sourcing and procurement regarding things that people really regard as strategic to their mission and they really ought to have control over versus paper clips. Yes. And one of the things we found was that, uh, and we, we spent, you know, in violation of the 80-20 rule, we spent a lot of time fighting, for example, with R&D over whether lab equipment was something they should have control over or whether that should be done centrally. And at the end of the day, uh, that was not a good use of our time. If you can, uh, it's hard for me to believe that people really care who makes the decisions about office supplies. And if you can start with, as you, and I saw your documents on this, because I think you're really all over that, and that's the way to do it. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It strikes me that you say there are certain things that are mandatory, that there's no strategic issue here, there's no agency specific issue, this is not something that you need to have control over. Let's agree on that. Let's, let's nail that one. That's mandatory. Uh, to, to, to talk about Liz's point. That's not about advocacy, that's non-negotiable. We are going to buy the paper clips. Now let's not, you know, let's fight another day over the things that you think you have control over. One of the things we found, for example, we were spending a huge amount of money on consultants, and obviously McKinsey, for example, knew a lot more about how many different people they were charging different rates than we did, but everybody felt they needed to have control over their decision making about consultants. So we said, we'll fight that battle later. Let's get the paper clips done. Yeah. So, so you, see, you see the initial cut at this 535 more than 150. I think to your point, Chad, yeah, even within the 150, yes. they're easier. You can buy right. So take the commodity. Take the low hanging right. fruit that nobody yeah. can legitimately argue yes. is a decision they should be making. Right. So it strikes me, Dan, when you talk about the history of this, we've sort of gone from all to nothing. Yes. Uh, you know, first it was all centralized, then it was all competitive. The fact is, there's different kinds of sourcing. There's some that should be centralized and there's some that maybe arguably should. Let's get the centralized ones done that everybody can agree on. We, we visited Hewlett Packard. They have an internal GSA-like organization and they control uh, or provide 90% of the spend built around planning and the planning is about how much am I gonna save you next year and not how much are we gonna spend uh, in the coming year. And I think that that's, you know, maybe there's some relative percentage, 90, 10, 80, 20, 65, 35, but it's really a balance of what are those things that you gain value from buying, centrally buying once and buying well, using your scale, and what are those things that are deeply mission critical to human services, uh, health and human the services, problem department is, transportation. Everybody's going to agree on the paper clip. The, the, the issue is when you try to move that line up to yeah. what, what is included in strategic sourcing, it, you get all the reasons why it can't be done. And so I actually think you got to take a little bit different approach, which the goal is there's an accountability to spend under management. Meaning everybody has to say, we have a target of how much is going to be managed centrally, and you have to get that bought off on, and you got to get to that goal. Because where think is that? It's the What's the percent? So spend under management under from our VMO slash procurement, we've got like seventy five percent of it under three quarters. So, and and I actually think the question is like I always get the argument that Jeff just made that there's expertise inside of a function that will do a better job. Right. I don't necessarily buy that. I, I agree with that. I agree with you. I mean, I, I know this is going to take an act of Congress, literally, but I think you have to edict, and I not advocate, edict. It all comes through a central location, and instead of saying, oh, and guess what, you get to spend the overage, I would say, here's your new budget, and it presupposes that some of the savings that you have in here, not all of it, but some of the $150 billion is cut out, because really when you do that forcing mechanism, people will want to do this. They, they would rather cut other people's money than their own budget. So I, I think that, I understand what you're saying exactly, Jeff, but they can opt out as opposed to opting in on the paper clips. Say all of it, it goes through central procurement and these strange and exotic, maybe will give you a hall pass. I guess I'm just sequencing this because I don't mm -hmm. disagree with anything you said. I'm just saying, Let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If we start the fight, if we start the fight over things they're going to want to control, we're going to miss the opportunity on the ones that we can agree on. The question I was asking is, why does somebody perceive that they're not getting enough value from whatever the central process is? Let's go there. So, Maurice, why do you not use GSA more than you do? If you're presupposing that you don't. <laughs> What's the issue? I think the issue is at least the perception that, well, first the issue is the desire to want to be in control, right? 
That's the first issue. But the second is the perception that we can get as good a price, if not better, uh, than GA, GSA. The third is the sense that uh, GSA, uh, this is not personal, <laughs> uh, the, the um, doubt that GSA will be a zealous advocate for us, right? So it's that trust issue. Do you, do you distinguish between different kinds of spend? So, you know, we're using paper clips as kind of an extreme, but there are certainly things like the smartphones that are used here that would you distinguish or would your people distinguish between the things that they would argue they could get a price on better versus the things that really are mission core that really need to be done by you? Um, I would say my folks have a rebuttable presumption. The rebuttable presumption is that we can do it better. And then let's check and see if GSA can beat us. Yes, which I do to, think. As opposed to the other way around. Yeah, that's the chicken and egg issue. Maurice hit the issues exactly right. Control, price, trust. and trust. I mean, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. So, and, and I would just say in that price thing, yeah. a lot of it's that chicken egg thing. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and by the it way, it's driven by one in three. I, but I, it ends up that not enough people participate. Right. Therefore, right. it probably is stretch. Well. And I would just complicate it for a little bit even more. So those same factors are actually at work within the department. So there are people within the department who will say, you know what, rather than using our procurement shop, maybe we should go to GSA because they can do it better than our procurement shop. So it's the same issues. Uh, and so it's- Be my uh, manager. Yes. So yes. Outside yes. So you don't yes. even get yes. scale. Uh, right. So we don't even, even within our enterprise right now, get a scale. But what has to happen is, right, you need to have a level of expertise inside of GSA where when they sit across the table from any other agency, person feels like this guy knows more about telecommunications or gal knows more about telecommunications than anybody inside my function just picking on moving up from paper clips and and I kind of feel like what we have to do is think about how do we get that level of expertise inside of GSA in a couple of functions where the other agencies feel yes there really is a benefit because this person is a true expert and it, it really comes down to value provided by the person sitting across the table you could kill that bird with the same stone as the trust issue by seeding the positions with people that come from the agencies. Yes. And we've talked that's, about that's just exactly that. right. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to try to centralize, then you've got to pull from your, you know, franchise teams in effect. Details because people. exactly. Um, the other thing is, why is it an either or? Why is it a joint thing so that you have on a project? a leader of GSA, and a business leader from the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So that, that's what we do on, on the things that Greg is talking about, where you, you know, functional expertise is critical. This is not a no-brainer type of thing. There, there's two people leading it, and that seems to do away with a lot of the, I'm throwing this over the wall to GSA, and, and, and please, I hope that they do it right. It's, it's a, why can't you do it as a team? Well, I mean, actually, uh, we did do a uh, paper clips contract that was one of our first strategically sourced uh, contracts on slide 12. Uh, you can see what the compliance is. But that was created the whole oh, year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, this uh, chart is yeah. the one with the agencies. Uh, we took the names off to protect the innocent, except GSA, uh, to show that I even have compliance within GSA. I have compliance problems within GSA. Only one third of my office supplies are actually bought through the strategic resource uh, office supply contract. Um, um, That's extraordinary. Where's the other two thirds bought? They're bought on our schedule. They're bought in the open market. They're bought Catalog. catalogs. With the, you know, what we've actually done is create. We go to Office Depot. Yeah. 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 Well, actually, but if you go to Office Depot, you'll use the government credit card. You'll actually, you will actually, whether you want to or not, you'll get the strategically sourced price. So we've made it a bit like. Um, I don't know, escape proof yes. in that sense. Uh, and but so, still, again, they are But people are years. working hard to get around it anyway. Exactly right. Exactly right. I do think, Dan, we, 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 some of us spent a few minutes with folks on your, on your team. And uh, I think all things pointed to going after commodities in this first big yeah. phase. I, you know, I, and I do think you want to make your way up the, uh, the food chain a little further over time. But um, the first issue was data. So how do you get yes. at the data? And some of the folks that, that work for you had jobs in other agencies as acquisition officers and commented that even within the agency, it was really hard to get data. 
So getting data from the suppliers, if you can force that, force that on them, and then focus on commodities and go after it hard, and obviously deliver value versus what they were spending before. You get the quick wins or relatively quick wins and move on to other perhaps more complex services um, at a point which you may even have better data right. on well, those services. One yeah. of the things that this, not just in this area, but the other areas that our group has worked on is that the time frame is much longer than your time frame. Okay, and um, when in building a system like this, it ultimately that's what's going to be required. You can do the one-offs that you're talking about and you can get savings, but you're not going to sustain it and have it ongoing unless you build a system, and the system won't be built within the time frame of, of your staying here. So in doing something like that, starting with commodities, there ought to be an effort that says, while we're doing this, we're going to build a system. Okay, so that when you guys leave, there's something left behind that somebody can inherit. And that's going to be as important as the short-term savings. This is the hard wire. Yeah, I think there's two parts of the system. I think there's the QSP 201 that you guys did, which is the set of policies informed by all the learnings. That's the bedrock in sustainable and continuous development. And there's the actual technical system that you talked about that eases implementation, improves the escape-proof nature of it and all those. We're trying to do both those things, and you're right. The best we can do is start and put it on a path where we've got some quick wins. Sam, you talked about this in our conversation, the importance of getting those quick wins, getting the buy-in, so that's virtuous. Dan, is there anything else you want to get out before we turn no, it to I, I actually think you ended pretty much where I wanted to end it, that our biggest challenge is, frankly, data. And I think maybe part of it is the quirk of history. When we decided to go full competitive was around the time that, frankly, um, many of our, uh, our best practices private sector organizations were automating. We were automating. And instead of automating once with one common system, with one common platform, so we had full visibility, we did it 37 times, at least. Uh, I, I think that there are multiple systems actually operating, or instances of systems operating within uh, agencies. So really, to be able to get to where we need to be, we have to see what we're spending, who, who we're spending uh, it with, how are we spending. In order to do that, we have to get, uh, you know, we have to get systems that will actually talk back to us. I would, I would actually say, Paul, and I completely agree with the data comment. It will always make you better. But you can actually make a lot of progress before you get a lot of data because you can you can actually figure out what are the big areas that you're spending a lot of money in. And back to your chicken and the egg problem, you got to solve that right away. And so what is what is the step to get people to say we're going to commit to participate because otherwise we won't get out the dime. Right. You take this slide and you say it has to be 100 percent. Every agency 100 percent. We're talking about office supplies, right? Yeah. Or the p page 11. These. Uh, activity so it's it's you know we're talking paper clips it's really beyond that yeah, it's hard for me to see maybe software licenses you could debate but it's hard for me to see where any of these other things that are listed on this page any agency should be able to argue we need to do that ourselves as long as you solve the chicken and egg problem and you pool the purchasing power you ought to be able to get better prices on anything on this page uh, together than you can alone and so make that mandatory and that's the quick win, that's the commodity. So Nobody that's can argue with that. You don't need a lot of data. That is, that's you the, don't need a lot of this data. This is the data. I think this yeah. is enough data. And it's all these things on this page. Travel service, hotel rooms, telecom management. Software licenses, as you'll get some fights about, I predict. But, but even there, but even there, there's going to be some things. Yeah. Different versions right. of Windows. Okay. So that, that I, I, so I'm, deep, I'm Homeland Security. We're third largest department about 400,000 people if you include our contractors. And, uh, we strategically sourced $3 billion last year and had a savings of almost $350 million. Um, and we're, we are all in on this. It is not a one size fits all. It is a one approach fits most. Um, and so that's the theory that we're operating on. Not a one size fits all. But like McDonald's proved successfully, one approach fits most. And so, you know, can you adapt in that kind of environment? What we, what we find is we're an overwhelmingly operational department. I mean, we're, we're in Washington. You can think of us as regulatory. We are policy making. We are. But we are overwhelmingly out there in field, Coast Guard, Secret Service, TSA, all of those things. Um, operators need a proximity to their procurement, as you all know. Um, that really is more than a cultural barrier to consolidation and, quote, headquarters doing it. It's a, it's a reality. I mean, in my previous job at the United Nations, 
you know, a, it is a very real, um, it's the plumbing and wiring, it's the oxygen of any operation. The thing that we encounter among, that's, that's in addition to all the issues that everybody, I think, very thoughtfully and usually put on the table is, we encounter, um, uh, we, in, we induce market distortion because of our volume sometimes. I mean, we completely distorted the lamb market in Central Africa at one point when I was at the UN. I mean, we, and there are other areas where we actually can induce market distortion because of the particularized needs that we have. So we have to be mindful of that in addition to sort of the small business thing and the, and, and the other rules of procurement that we want to adhere to. But what I, what I thought I was hearing is, you know, let's just mandate. And we can do a lot of mandating. We have in Homeland Security. We've done a lot of mandating. You know, we're a relatively new department. Uh, so on the one hand, it was hard to do mandating because we had 22 different agencies that strays back to 1790 and sort of figured out, you know, look, we know how to run things. Uh, yeah, but, you know, Eisenhower's out of office, so <laughs> let's catch up with, you know, the reading. Um, so the, the mandating thing is right, but driving it all to a single source solution. Um, well, can I, can I just ask you, and truly, genuinely interested, if you look at this list on 11, uh, office supplies, travel services, hotel rooms, things like that. It, it, as a matter of principle, uh, would you object or would your people object to mandates on things like that? No, we, we already have. I we know, have. central mandates from GSA as opposed to within the department. No, and in certain respects, we, we essentially conform to right. the, the... So you could solve the chicken and egg problem, theoretically which I do think is part of the issue here, because you, as you said, you, you're not sure you're getting the price, but you're not getting the price because nobody has, people can opt out. So if you, if you truly mandated, these activities here are gonna be done centrally, period, full stop. Everybody's in. Is that something you, your people would have a problem with? Um, I, so the, the answer, like anything, is it, it, it sort of depends. I mean, on, on paper clips, the, the higher you go up to mission criticality, and you get you get there for us pretty low. Nine millimeter ammunition, you're already there. Yeah. But we've mandated that. We've mandated central, you know. Right. You know, we've we're talking about hotel rooms. And right. Um, Dan, just the, the, the deceptive, I hope. $743 million of $150 billion opportunity. That's what you're doing right now. That's, what say. That's not what the, not these the represent. This no. office buys alone is a million dollars, correct? Yes. Okay. So that's that. So that's a, that's it's a much bigger and, number. And much bigger. I mean, all, we, the government spends across these, I would yes. guess, 10, 15, 20 billion dollars. Yeah. More. Yeah. 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 So if you just mandated these and centralized them, the opportunity is huge. Right. It's huge. It, before you get to arguments about what's mission critical or not, right. just this alone. But then, yes. you know, for instance, in order to get the travel you know, fully realize the benefits of travel fully realize we have to have everyone adopt the same travel system. And we never it's even got the travel system, the original one we put in right, place, right. fully adopted. And you know, there are agencies, there are bureaus within agencies that say, yeah, that doesn't work for us. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, see that's that's the challenge you're always gonna have. You can always find the reason why exactly. not to do something. So and I, I don't mean to I don't mean to sound like I understand all the complexity. But when you say somebody negotiated a rate for a hotel room, right? You, you negotiate, you picked what the standard hotel room is going to be across everybody. That doesn't matter what system it's in. It's that you know you always stay at this. Sorry. That's right. And so, so I think to Jeff's question, I was going to go to the point you made, Jane, which there's 350 million dollars that you've already figured out how to save, right? How does that fit into these categories? And would we have gotten scale? By being able to do it more centrally, I think that was really the because you've already solved for 350. I mean, that's fantastic. Within her department, within her, within within your department, that's great. So now, can we take how much of that was in these buckets, and can we then extend that to other agencies? Well, I, I also want to right. just challenge to build on Enrique is that um, there seems to be a bit of naivete to, in my mind that that going central that every single. Um, actions that I give the GSA, I am going to get a better price on that particular action. It doesn't work that way. So this is the kind. It's called the greater good, and it ladders up. Right. So we've had situations where I am, where I've had to centralize things, and I've said, I know that you're getting charged more now, but guess what? When I put this all together, net at the top, we're saving a lot more money. But you're right. On the margin, on that decision, you're now paying twenty dollars more for your hotel room. But we're doing it for the greater. That seems to be not part of the conversation here. Price versus cost. You can take a, a, a contracting official working for another agency, you go, 
and use our strategically sourced uh, office supply contract and get a better price for a stapler. But I had to pay the big contracting official. I had to, you know, put well, it's, also on the market. it's also yeah. on the market. Right. If you exactly. continue right. to look at every, and empower people as advocates to look at every decision on the margin, the reality is, I'm going to make a guess. When you let's say you centralize everything, 30% of the time you are going to pay more for your, you know, individual thing that you might have doing it on your own. But at the end of the day, once you finish boiling, you've saved a boatload of money. There seems to be um, not not an understanding and an acceptance is that every time a decision gets made on the margin, now that it's centralized, I might or might not on that decision be in a better or worse position. And so you're allowing people to opt out on every marginal decision. Well, Liz, I would say though, yes, I mean, I think, I think you, you get there's a lot of great conversation about the great yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. There's a lot of passion about this, and I agree with, with what Liz just said that we're not maybe seeing always the bigger picture. But uh, to get us going, I mean, they've already done a lot of great work. So how do we pick something and drive it across the as much of the government? federal government as possible. So what if you were to say pick three areas, yep. whatever those three are, and Absolutely. maybe they're on this list. I agree. Right. right. And, then, right. and then just say, let's go around and figure out how we advocate for this to be consolidated centrally in a way that so, you can so get the leverage. I think, you might lose like I think we I think early as a government we've picked a few areas and made some early progress. Yep. Right. Yes. It's early progress. So now we have to you, I guess there's a strategic choice to you drive those to hundred percent. I would or do you add more? I would add more drive toward the form because because, because the, yeah. if this is a case of not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. You have to get people used to the idea that certain decisions made centrally will yes. respond to your point earlier, which uh, was well summarized: control, trust, and price. That means everybody's got to get in the pool on it. Take one of these things that should not be controversial: office supplies, travel service, hotel rooms. Make it mandatory, 100% solve for it. Then you'll create a momentum around the whole concept. GSA will have more credibility. People will believe that it can get things done. Early wins. I think that's the way to go. But, but, and by the way, I would argue hotel rooms could be actually be easier than office yes. supplies. And the, reason, and the reason, let me tell you why. Don't get me wrong. You should work on the office supply issue. Mm -hmm. But you have a logistics delivery component mm -hmm. to that. While with hotel rooms, it's actually, there is a price. And there is a specific set of places you stay, and I guarantee you, you could drive that one without a lot of right. and And to Liz's challenge. point, I do think you have to find, you have to at some point, the agencies, to the extent that they have marginal increases be for the benefit of the whole, they have to get some benefit from what the whole gets to, to be yes. participating. Or at least have some visibility into it. Right? Yeah. So, so, the, yeah, one other comment I'd like to quickly make is that um, the systems issue is going to be a constant barrier to trying to get something done. And I would encourage you to think about what I call low-tech system solutions. Don't change the system. Change the data in the system. So, you know, load the hospital, load the um, hotel rates into the 37 existing mm -hmm. systems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Load the yeah. procurement vendors into those systems yeah. as opposed to focusing on eliminating and centralizing all the systems. So it may not be good example. You have phrasing and don't change the system to do it. Change the data in the systems. So for example, if you have a procurement system that's set up to purchase hotel rooms, don't worry about centralizing all 36 systems to use the same hotel rooms. Change the data in the system so that someone gets on that system they use that hotel and they yeah. use that rate. Change the databases in the system yes. and have a way to control that. That's a lower tech, quicker, faster solution to get adherence and consistency. You know what, I would just give you another comment. There was a friend of mine who runs a software company in the Northwest that you're all probably familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, he basically had all of his startups. Startup. Sorry. Startup company. Startup company. He had 25 years ago as a startup. <laughs> so, he basically had all. He had a specific initiative, and I won't go into the details. But that he said, "I want, I want adherence to this." And he had every one of his line executives come in and say, "Tell me how you're going to achieve this." And it's not about months and years. It was about a short period of time. And so you pick something and you say, "How do we get adherence to our directive on we're going to get everybody consolidated on the top three things we picked: hotel rooms, telecommunications, and office supplies, or whatever it was." And and everybody had to come forward and say, "Here's what it is." And then he said, "So tell me right now." why you won't be able to adhere to what you just told me. And he had zero tolerance for people not complying. And so it was, it was a very just, everybody comes in, presents, 
and to hold them accountable together. Right. So let's work go right. to, we have about 15 minutes left in the session. Let's go to eight and nine, and Gail, is there anything that we haven't hit on that you want to emphasize when you're going across the um, Well, let me start by saying that I feel your pain. <laughs> I, I feel like I kind of inherited something that mirrors what you're struggling with on a much, much smaller scale. Um, we have a four-prong mission, and two of the prongs are responsible for most of our procurement. Disaster services, where we're responding to 70,000 disasters, and we're getting meals, and equipment, um, cots, blankets, and then biomedical. And I, I highlight that one because there's a lot of strange and exotic stuff that we have to buy, like testing agents, et cetera. And yet we still centralize procurement for that as well. And I'll, I'll explain how we compensated for the, you know, the expertise and you know, how did you do this with something that isn't paper clips. Um, our challenge was that everything was decentralized. Um, everything was optional. We had 700 chapters that were operating as independent units. So, and just to illustrate how out of control all of this was, I have 33 blood services operations. In 33 units, we had 69 vendors just for t-shirts. So, you know, and that's about as paper clip as you can get. So, you know, the starting point was, as I said, pretty similar. So what we did is we stood up a shared services model. So we took all procurement out from under these separate places that were doing all the purchasing. And it might have been a little bit easier for me to do this because the folks that are out there, but I would suspect it's similar in your units as well, they're very mission driven and they don't get their jollies from buying paper clips. So did they think that um, a centralized procurement function would get them a better price? I'm not too sure, but I can tell you that they didn't really feel like doing this anyway, so it was probably easier to rest some control. So um, the other thing that we did that might get rid of the, the challenge of the strange and exotic is instead of aligning around functions like contracts or payment, we aligned around business units. So the people that were procuring for biomedical actually understood those kinds of vendors and what the, the um, agents and uh, kits and medical supplies were being used for. So they could speak the language after a while when we, we structured it this way. So that was a, a big improvement. And then when, if you look at the bottom of, of um, the page, you can see the strategic sourcing process. So what we did there is instead of being transactional, we became very strategic. We literally, from the planning perspective, said, how much do you want? What do you want to buy? What are your future requirements? And we did this with every single vendor that we were, were using in the process. And then the manage piece, which is essential, is we keep managing that ongoing relationship with the vendor. And by the way, we can buy a lot of our disaster supplies off of the GSA schedule. We do it religiously, and we save a boatload of money. So I'm going to put in a commercial for GSA. Um, and then I just would. I, I mean, and by the way, my team is like, why do we think they can do better than we can? And I said, they can't. Just you know, you've got to try it. Come back and tell me it doesn't work, but try it. So you know, we're very much there. So if you just look at the second page, I'll make a couple of points on this. Um, we did deploy additional um, data sets because we had so many things going on, so many different places. So we went to Oracle for the financial stuff. We went to Ariba for procurement. And I did hear a lot of squawking about you know, I don't like this system, it, it's user hostile, and you know, it, it became just try it, you're gonna learn to love it. And eventually that, that is what happened. I mentioned that we aligned with the business units. Um, the notion of having competing goals, like you need environmentally friendly suppliers, et cetera, et cetera, we had two competing goals too. We wanted to improve the proportion of minority and women-owned businesses in our supply set, because as you can see where we started, it was abysmal. And it took us a while to even figure out, you know, because we didn't have data either, how, what percentage it was. It was only 2%. So by the end of fiscal year, we were up to 10. This year, we're gonna um, end higher than 15. 
But the most important thing is we save money, improve quality, and improve this. So they're, they're not necessarily competing priorities. And they, they sometimes can work in lockstep. And um, you, can, you can see the savings that we were able to manage to get. And that becomes the cause celeb. I mean, as soon as people saw this, and I translated it back into headcount. I basically said, this is how many people that we would have to lay off. And I know you can't do that, but there's some other unit of measurement that you can use that can galvanize people. But it's, this is how many jobs we, we save by doing nothing more than buying smarter. So, um, you know, I think a lot of it is a major cultural shift. A lot of it is a trust me. You know, a, a lot of times I said, let's just try it. We can always back off if, if it doesn't mm -hmm. work. And I have to say, you know, I was using words like mandate, edict. I had no teeth in this. I, you know, we since changed our governance so that the chapters do ultimately report into one location. But this was just me trying to get this through through influence. And you know, if if you tee it up in a way that the people that are impacted see the benefit to them, it, it and you sound like you believe it. Um, I, I do think you can prevail, and you know, if all else fails, I've learned that just nagging <laughs> consistently without stopping will eventually exhaust people, and they'll 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 Let, let's do comply. This, Joe, one, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm done. Joe, why don't you present a straw man in real time as yeah. to where we want to what we want to do across the next few months, and then in October. Got real progress. Absolutely. Early results. So, and then we can get feedback on that That'd, for the last five or ten minutes. That'd be great. So, how I'm going to do that is taking uh, some of the potential tactical applications that I had handed out at the beginning in the lesson large slide, and then all the input that you guys have just given have already refined some of those based on um, what I heard today. So, first, laying out, and this is a very straw man for pressure testing type of idea, but the goal would be to try to save. $10 billion over the next two years through strategic sourcing. A real number, an aggressive man on the moon type target, but one that I th we think is achievable. What's the process based on what I'm hearing now, you know, focusing the process to, to that? I think there's two problems. One is we've got to drive increased utilization of our current federal strategic sourcing initiative vehicles. We've got a few that stood up. You see in the document that opt in is just, or the opt out is too powerful. We've got to We've got to figure out the right ways to drive increased utilization. I hear a lot of mandate, but we've got to do that in partnership with the agencies. We'll figure that out. And then the second prong is incre uh, increasing the number of vehicles that we have. So the sub bullets are we've got to improve the agency high level accountability, but also create a steering committee where we've got the partnership so we don't act ahead of what all of your needs are. We get the buy in, but we do it quickly. And then on the second front, we've got to improve the data. So inserting a contracting clause in new contracts that says you have to give us that price and volume data. So we, we will still have our own data systems that we populate, but we'll also be able to get that uh, from the agencies. So what, what does that look like by October? So we can come back to you with some real progress and things to discuss. I see three things that I would like to be back here talking about with you. One an update on where we are on the utilization of those federal strategic sourcing how, 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 in order to how many vehicles are we talk about right now? So there's office supplies. Six, yeah. And they cover a large Office area. supplies, um, wireless, uh, domestic delivery, and a few other nice stuff. Exactly. Is there anything in the travel space? We, we have already a very robust uh, travel management. Uh, we competed that. There's some opportunities around car rental. We've but we're thinking things. a half dozen or so mm -hmm. things like those that we just mentioned. Yes. That you're going to drive toward or you going to. Yeah, exactly. So we'll give you a from to on the utilization and say, hey, did the things that we hear happen? So, sorry, back up. So we're going to have to issue some sort of guidance in collaboration with the agencies, but to the agency saying, okay, against those two prongs, here are the specific things you need to do. Based on that, there'll be a from to on the utilization of the vehicle, so you can say, hey, do these things work, or how do we need to course correct? And then secondly, uh, we'll update you on some of the progress on the new target list. You know, to Jeff's point, and I know that there was a lot of discussion there, but what I heard you really saying is it's a continuum. It's not binary choice, but it's a continuum, and we've got to move up that value chain, and at a certain point to James, uh, to 
James feedback, it may, the cost benefit may peter out, but we're a long way away from that. Right. So we're gonna continue, we've got some things at one end of the chain, we're gonna keep moving up. So we're gonna tell you how we're doing against the ones we have. We're gonna tell you some of the things that we're targeting and that are in progress and, and why those are right things. Sure. And then, Could, I'm sorry, please, please, please. Just one, one thought, combining something Liz said with something Gail said. If you come up with this $10 billion moonshot idea, yeah. thinking of a way to translate it, obviously you can't use the metric you use, but some metric that says this is going to be, to Liz's point, by working together we're going to create something that is of value to all of us yes. and probably relate back to the budget in some way mm -hmm. because that's where the rubber meets the road. Yes. So if we collectively deal with this chicken and egg and we get all in and we save $10 billion, here's what it will mean to your agency in a real way by, to Liz's point, giving up at the margins We'll get something together. I don't know what that metric is, right. but something like what Gail was talking And we've got about. a thread of real needle between what, what Debbie's talking about and has been so successful, which is getting agency participation by saying you can cut here and reinvest in mission critical things. Also taking account what Gail says, which is we're tough budgetary times. So let's give some of those savings back. Well, maybe you take them out of saying the if we save billion. 10 billion, here's the piece of it you're going to get back. That's exactly right. So that's pretty pretty simple. So you're right that we need to refine the metric and we want to address both of those. You know, one cautionary note on this approach, and I don't know the right answer here, but if you keep moving up the ladder one piece at a time, you're in effect sort of slowly ripping this Band-Aid off, and at the very end of the process, you're going to have all the, the sacred cows that people don't want to touch, and it's going to really be hard to blow through that last piece of it. So I'm going to throw out a wacky idea, but I don't know if this makes any sense, because I'm thinking a little bit with my mouth here, but um, if you took one that was complex and hard, instead of the paper clips, the travel, et cetera, et cetera, and a separate group try to tackle that, because you're not going to be creating enough muscle memory on how to do this if you're just going to do the real low-hanging fruit. And maybe you stop at the end of the low-hanging fruit. I mean, maybe that's the answer. But I, I would just encourage you to don't just do the easy stuff because, you know, you can't declare success and say, see how easy that is? Now we're going to buy missiles. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's not going to work that way. Yes. And, you know. and I would add to that, um, even the low-hanging fruit can be difficult. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, someone used the word non-controversial -con earlier. I don't think there's anything yeah. that's not controversial. Yeah. I mean, even hotel rooms, as, as easy as that sounds, you know, there are people that are going to say, oh, I want to stay closer sure. to where the conference is, or oh, I've been staying at that hotel, or, or right, I get frequent flyer. I mean, yes. nothing's easy. <laughs> and so, you know, there are going to be, there's resistance all, and whether I've done this with McKinsey or Booz Allen or whoever's come in and said, I can get you, you know, 10 million here and, you know, 20 million here, you never get all of it. And I think that's, you, you have to be realistic about that. And whether you get 80% of it or 85% yes. of it, it's a constant challenge. It's an ongoing process. And, you know, I, I would hate for you to set sites and say, I'm going to get $3 billion and you only get $2 billion and so folks are disappointed. I mean, it, it's, it's always... Um, a push and always, you know, even if you have a mandate, people find ways uh, to get around it. So I think you just have to keep so that in mind. Who's driving this project? Is Joe driving it? Are you driving it? Jeff, who's driving this? Like, to Joe's on my team, right? So the right. Joe's driving it. Obviously, Dan is critical to it, and then it's all the deputies, the business management council. So when you're here, so is that it has to, you know, drive it through agency. So it's so very senior buying? level involvement. Do you, think it, do you feel like you're buying? Oh, so I think there's no question there's buying in deputies. I mean, we've saved, you know, a billion four in, in our department in seven years, and the bulk of that in the last three and a half. I mean, we came in, Secretary came in with what we call efficiency initiatives, um, which had 30, 60, 90. What can we do in 30 days? What can we do in 60? What can we do in 90? Creating a culture and expectation. We also have the sort of the let's build the department together kind of thing because Homeland Security is still relatively new. I mean, it's 10 years old. It's not one year old to the 10th time. I mean, it, but there was a period of time in our life where we were repeating you know, the mistakes of our founding year. I love the, I love the phrase, let's put, it on, let's put the money on the screen. 
we have a version of that. You know, let's put it on the border. Let's put it in the airports. Let's put it in, you know, we want to put it at the operational line. So I'm, what I'm, I'm sort of trying to understand the message of this conversation because it's not, should we do strategic sourcing or not? The answer is, of course we should. Right. The, the, the issue is, under what conditions does a government-wide centralization of the functionality make sense as opposed to the value proposition for money? I mean, we take the government rate in hotels. We don't take the Homeland Security rate in hotels. You know, we take, so you know, we're making use of this. Um, and, and we're, we're going to do more. We've got a, almost four dozen active initiative programs that could be bucketized in certain respects. And they range in everything from the paper clip, you know, nine millimeter weapon, up to, and this is a very big lift I've been working on for 18 months, which is common airframe procurement. I mean, the Border Patrol's got 27 different airframes. Coast Guard's got four. You know, there's something But I think what you're so, hearing from, and I love Tim's analogy, he started 20 years ago. I think what you're hearing from from the private sector is that threshold of commonality is much further along than you think, I think, to Greg's point. So, so Jeff, you're, Jeff. to Jeff's point, I'm so sorry. It's okay, it's a compliment. I agree with Jeff anyway. Um, but that, that, that threshold is much further out than you think, and we, you know, it's not, it's not about paper clips and hotel rooms that they, that you can push it much further than you think you can. I'm sitting here now. But I think there, we agree with There's you. one message, though, that, that I don't think Sorry. we can overemphasize, <laughs> and that is that, that you will get your employees to say, this is really a great thing, but it doesn't really apply to me. Right. That's what I mean. Okay, and, and it's absolutely guaranteed that you will get that. And so you have to be able to sit there and say, Yes, it does apply to you, and you must comply. Yeah. Anything less than that, you're going to miss the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I if anything that. else, take that away. Possibility, however remote it might be, that the fact that it's costing more on the margin will ultimately lead to a better I think that's my one ask is, you know, for our subcommittee especially, between now and October, we're going to need to continue to meet with the experts that you've pinpointed as well as some of yourselves to pressure test the ideas as we move pretty aggressively. So, you know, Tim, when we met with your team, they talked about the Loctite example. That's what Liz is saying, which is, you know, to try to break through and say, we want to own this. They'd say, look, I can buy Loctite for three bucks. The strategic sourcing effort Cummins wide is 350. Let me just do my own thing. We got to break through some of these and we're going to need your well, experience. One, so the one that I got was on the travel. We standardized and got huge savings, but the guys in India said, we got a local one and we can get a better deal on Air Force. And you literally had to say, you will lose your job if you don't follow the procedure. You will lose your job. All right. This a great session. Joe will, working with Dan and uh, deputies, pull together a plan. Yes. And we'll get that out in the next week or so. Uh, feedback. But this one has such potential. Yes, uh, I mean, this is just. Yeah. You're walking over dollar bills. You oh. just need to pick them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, it's complex, but. So the Jeff's framework and others, it's a very low hanging fruit. Let's nail that. That'll build the muscle and then we pick on that. Yes. I think uh, just one, one last comment. Yes, please. Listening please. to everything is um, I would burn a lot of calories and cycles on the incentives to get this done. Because what strikes me, and we can debate, and I agree, I totally agree with both everything said about pick three, just be, start with whatever it is. Just don't try to boil the ocean. Be very composite, very specific. Second, inspect what you expect in terms of cadence and visibility and review. One, one thought would be, not to be controversial, but we talk about this notion of centralized procurement. You don't want to think about centralized results. Because this department says, I saved 50 million, I saved 100 million. Some of it's bullshit. You say, time out. We're going to have a clearinghouse here. We're going to identify it. To make, so centralized, I would have a third idea of centralized measurement. So every organization isn't just saying, uh, we are fantastically great when the OMB rolls it up and says, you know, we got a budget problem. Everybody's saving everything, but nothing's rolling. <laughs> and lastly, I would re it's about incentives because unlike the private sector, and it's much easier for us, think about what is the motivation, what is the incentives. Is it a give back of a proportion of I don't know, but I, I think you really need to solve that. And then the earlier commentary on what and how and review is easier. But incentives is tricky. Agreed. All right. Great session.